So this is Andrew Erdman, who is uh, moved from the city to the uh, New Mexico Interstate Stream Commission, and he is the let's see, water planning program manager. Is that correct? That's and it. He's yeah. Going to talk about the fifty-year um, water plan that the Interstate Stream Commission has just come up with. And I finally did what was able to read the article in the paper. I thought you guys did a really good job in terms of explaining things. So um, go for it. Welcome. Well, thanks, Carl. Um, I know Maury said I could share my screen, see if I can master that here. Um, Hmm. Oh, I see what the problem is. Just one sec. Sorry. Um. Okay. Does this look? Is this looking normal? Sarah, you'll probably yeah. let me know if this looks really stupid, huh? Um, yeah, it, it, it's got you and Sarah. Uh, yeah, we got it. Okay. Every now and then it does weird stuff with PowerPoint, and I don't. I don't know how to. I don't have much control. So. Um, yeah, so I'm I'm Andrew Erdman, and like Carl said, I'm the I'm now I guess the planning program manager over at ISC. I left the city back uh, right around Thanksgiving, and uh, we've just gotten our, our draft 50-year uh, water plan together, and it's going out. We tried to roll it out for public comment and had a little bit of trouble, but it will be available for public comment really soon. Um, so I'm going to go through kind of what's what the plan is and what's in the plan um, and, and how you can go about providing comment. And if you want to jump in and ask questions, um, I can only see a few people on the side, but you can just just interrupt me and jump in. Um, so uh, the 50 year water plan, it's a governor's initiative. Um, the purpose of it is to help New Mexico plan for climate change impacts to water supplies. Uh, it's being written for. Um, decision makers primarily, but we're hoping it's kind of legible or, or readable and makes sense to the general public. Um, it's It keeps getting longer, but the intent is that it will be a concise bottom line upfront summary of the needs and recommendations for improving water resilience. It's really all about resilience. That's kind of the theme of the report. Um, and then I have to go through the stuff of what the plan isn't too, because we've done some, uh, some various plans over the years and uh, it's hard to figure out how they all fit together. So, um, so it's not the state water plan. Um, the state water plan. We uh... lost your sound. Can you hear him? Andrew, we can't hear you. Andrew. Um, it's not a... Oh, uh oh. Oh, good. Great. Great. Back up a little bit. Um, okay, so so it's not the regional water plans, so it's not the state water plan. That's a every five year statutory thing. Um, neither is it the regional water plans. I'm, I'm gonna stop my video in case that helps. Um, it's also not the regional water plan. So those were just updated in 2017, starting to feel like a while back, but those don't have a regular recurrence. So those come up uh, when they come up. And there was a ton of interest when we did public uh, engagement for the 50 year plan, but um, at this point, there's no schedule for the regional plans. Um, it's not a technical report. The whole thing's about 50 pages. It's not all gloom and doom. It's only about half. And uh, there's also a lot of uh, information about places where New Mexico is doing a good job being resilient already. Uh, it's not solving all the water problems for the state, right? So it's a 50 plan. I mean, it looks out 50 years, right, for what the climate change impacts are likely to be but it really lays out kind of next steps. We don't have 50 years worth of steps in this 50 page document, um, which kind of leads to this not going to sit on a shelf piece, which is because um, this is really intended to be a living document to get us started and working towards resilience. But uh, a lot of what we're facing is uncertainty. So um, we're trying to get started moving in that direction, but, but it's gonna require ongoing work. Okay. Um, so, so this presentation here, this kind of goes through a lot of what's like in the report so that you can kind of, I mean, we're really hoping to get comments back from all sorts of people. So it'd be great if people on here could, uh, could, could provide some comments that'll be available really soon. Um, so the, the main, you know, kind of goals of the report are to look at the impacts of climate change, evaluate vulnerabilities across the state, 
uh, engage with New Mexicans and develop goals to improve resilience, and uh, then to recommend specific actions to do that. There's three main principles of the plan. So this is sort of how it was presented by the governor and what she asked for, uh, stewardship, sustainability, and equity. Um, all the recommendations for the plan are, are based around those principles. I'm gonna talk about that more in just a minute. Um, this one of the important pieces here that we cover in kind of the introduction to the report, which this is summarizing, is the history of water management in the state. So we've always had this hugely variable, very dry climate, um, but there's also been people here a long time. So um, acknowledging that the resilience of tribes, pueblos, and nations, and the sequia culture, um, and all the information that you know, irrigated agriculture and public water systems, all the experience that all these different water users have had, is a is an important piece of this. Um, conservation is a huge impact or a, key, a huge focus too. So, um, yeah. So um, I mentioned earlier that Sarah, Sarah and I are the entire planning team, right? So, uh, so this has relied to a large extent on a whole bunch of partnerships. And I am realizing that I promised I was not going to show this without the Asakia specifically called out on a bullet. And I am doing that anyway, because I forgot to add it. So, um, so I'm going to acknowledge the, the contributions from the Asakia Water Planning Working Group first, right? That's a group of the uh, Parcianches and, and Meyer Donmos and folks from uh, the Asakia Commission and the association who work to pull together a bunch of uh, Asakia recommendations that are that are on their own in the report that kind of, um, there, there's some areas where the ISC and the Asakias aren't on the same page. So uh, it is a way to try and work together. We have sections within the report that are written by the Asakias and another um, from the Tribal Water Working Group, who's a group that have been working to capture some of the breadth of voices relative to values on, on tribal water rights. Um, we also relied on a lot of work from the Bureau of Geology and Mineral Resources. So that's the, the technical folks who pulled together the climate change projections that are really the basis for this. Um, there's been a lot of help from volunteer research experts, the Indian Affairs Department, I already mentioned the Tribal Water Working Group. Um, We've had some partnerships and a lot of time spent reviewing, working with different state agencies, including the ones here, the state engineer, uh, EMNRG, the environment department, the ag department, game and fish, um, homeland security, economic development, department of health. I'm sure there's more. Um, the water dialogue also held two annual events that were in support of this and the water resources research institute has done some technical work and had a conference last year focused on this. Um, and then the army corps has has been supporting all this with a planning assistance to the state's grant, which is a pretty formal um, support process, and they've helped a lot with pulling together the report. Um, so with that, I'm going to talk a little bit here about the climate change impacts and what we're expecting and what's kind of the basis for the report, what we're trying to plan to solve. Um, so you're looking at here in these two graphs, uh, the, the red is temperature. Each of the individual dots is an individual year. The horizontal lines are 10-year averages. Um, so you can see that in the last few decades, those averages have been steadily increasing already, and that's expected to continue. Uh, on the bottom, that graph is about precipitation, works the same way. So the horizontal bars are 10-year averages. Um, there's a ton of variability, right? That's, that's one of the easy things to kind of see with that. And that basically is expected to continue, kind of a similar amount of precipitation to what we've seen in the past, but stretched over a, a longer, hotter summer. Um, and being consumed more aggressively by, by plants and evaporation because of the, <clears throat> because of the longer, hotter summer. Um, so we're looking at here, this is a map of expected change in temperature. Um, I feel like it really makes it look very much like it's much, much hotter in the northwest corner of the state. But the real takeaway here is that the whole state is looking at like a five degree increase on average. Um, and um, that's a lot, right? So we're talking about basically it feeling a little more like uh, Roswell, like the Roswell of today, if you're in Albuquerque, or, you know, Taos could be a little bit more like Farmington, looking out 50 years, so um, hotter and drier. Um, this, these three maps are showing change in aridification. So the top left over here is, is sort of the historic period. Obviously, New Mexico is the desert, has a fair amount of arid landscapes to begin with, but those, we're expecting that there will become more aridification. And it's not just a matter of um, that, that has implications for soil health and plant type, and it's, uh, it's, it's getting desert here. Um, this other map here in all red just shows the areas of change kind of statewide. So even in areas where it isn't fully gonna become arid, everything is becoming more arid, basically. Um, 
And then this last map here, this, this shows some of the national context. Presumably, this is also the case of Mexico, though this was put together by the US government. So we just drew the line and called it gray down there, I guess. Um, but essentially what we're looking at here is change in water stress. So everywhere that it's brown and the darker, the, the worse, those are places where we're expecting more shortage and more water stress. Um, this, the opposite is true of the blue. So those are places that are expecting a lot more water. So um, one of the reasons we put this up here when we do these presentations is to make it clear that it isn't, this isn't just a New Mexico problem and there's not a solution to be had in Utah or Colorado or any of our neighboring states because they're all facing the same, same situation. Okay, this is kind of a long list actually, and we pulled this together for a, uh, for a presentation to the climate masters back in the fall, actually, but um, but I keep going through this because it, it's important to understand that it's not just about heat. So there's the average temperature rise of five to seven degrees, um, lower stream flow, which has lower aquifer recharge as a result. Um, we're expecting that the variability will become greater from year to year in terms of how much water uh, is there. It certainly feels like that this year when it's either I don't know how many of you are in Santa Fe, but we got a ton of rain last night <laughs> in the middle of the afternoon yesterday where I am. Um, hotter and more severe droughts, decreasing snowpack with earlier runoff, greater demands on groundwater due to surface water shortfall, right? So to the extent that people are using surface water and then backing it up with their groundwater, we're concerned that as groundwater becomes less available, that'll be an increased demand on wells. Um, stress on natural vegetation because of increasing temperature and decreased water availability, increased fires and frequency of fires, uh, increasing floodment and sediment transport due to these bigger sediment or uh, bigger storm events. Um, soil, just damage to soils, loss of soil health through vegetation and erosion and uh, degraded quality of surface waters as well. So um, that's the gloom and doom. That's the, the part that is a little gloom and doomy. Um, but the next piece here of the report is looking at how we assess resilience. Um, so part of this project has been, and actually some of, the, some of you may have been involved last summer, there was a lot of public outreach that was based on different sectors of water use and looking for um, what makes for resilient water use. Uh, after a lot of detailed analysis, it, it really seemed to us that there's really five big issues that related uh, to resilience and they're certainly interrelated, but they cross also most of the sectors of water use. Um, so water diversity, so is there both surface and groundwater available or multiple sources of groundwater? Availability, is there actually enough water available? Uh, demand management is really closely related to availability because that determines sort of how much it's needed. So looking at abilities to uh, conserve water. Um, capacity of infrastructure, so that includes like storage tanks and diversion structures and uh, flood control. Um, looking at all those list of, of concerns we saw in that last slide, you know, basically the infrastructure to cope with all that. Um, and then finally, you know, watershed health. It's really hard to uh, overestimate the importance of maintaining healthy watersheds uh, and the, the sort of upland, what we've called upland watersheds in the report, the, the forests at the top of the watershed are where almost all the water falls in the state. Apparently it's, you know, 75 to 80% of the precipitation in the entire state lands there. So making sure that, that the water that comes out of those areas is healthy is critical for users across the whole state. Okay, so then when we get into the recommendations, right? So this is the part where we've tried to put together recommendations for how to start moving forward on this. And, and more than any of the other stuff we've covered so far, this is where it'd be great to get input from people. So, um, as I mentioned, we have sort of these three core principles of stewardship, sustainability, and equity. Um, these aren't really discrete categories, which I'm sure uh, I'm sure people will notice as I talk about these things. And we've kept them in the center because it really feels like uh, they're really important principles, even though they're not completely mutually exclusive categories. Um, and so for the purpose of the report, our stewardship recommendations are yeah, I'm going to talk about that in the next slide here, but I just want to mention that there's a lot of overlap between these three different pieces. Uh, equity in particular is sort of a principle that we need to make sure is present as we do work moving forward. Um, but first, I'm going to talk about the, uh, the stewardship recommendations. So we have three kind of individual one-page summaries that are in the report or the draft report. Um, those areas are supposed to really replicate or, or, or model the, the water cycle. So improving up on watershed health. Uh, and then it has these individual action steps within that, um, protecting, oh, you know, sorry, these are in kind of a funny order for me. Improving up on watershed health, and then it's improving health of rivers, lakes, and reservoirs, 
um, and then improving ground or protecting groundwater health. So those three components are really how we're looking at stewardship, really pretty specifically focused on environmental um, care. The next set of recommendations are about sustainability. Uh, so the, the intent for us with sustainability was to sort of look, look forward, things that actually look forward at the expected changes here with climate change and how to, how to manage water in the face of that. So modernizing administrative practices, modernizing water infrastructure and continuing to uh, innovate or with water conservation. Um, in that piece in particular, I just want to mention we have this piece about working with farmers, which you know sounds real straightforward. Um, agricultural water use in general is about 75 or greater percent of the water use in the whole state of New Mexico. There's a lot of nuance to that, depending on what type of agriculture you're talking about, return flows and groundwater recharge and everything from you know surface water acequias to, to center pivot sprinklers out in the middle of nowhere near surface water. Um, so one of the real important pieces for us moving forward is going to be trying to um, better understand agriculture and like the there's there's a lot of factors that determine what people grow and how <clears throat> how they irrigate wherever they're located. So um, trying to figure out how to break that down so we can really better target conservation solutions that are appropriate for the particular application. Um, then last, the equity piece here. So we got four sets of recommendations there. The first two, uh, engagement with tribes, pueblos, and nations, and protecting acequias. Those are really some outreach areas that we've been really trying to focus on. Uh, a lot of the history between the, the state and, and user groups of water is about litigation. So we're really trying to work more proactively with planning with some of these groups um, and, and to try and have sort of ongoing relationships so that we're constantly like checking in and attending meetings and getting feedback. So, um, so those are two of the real priority pieces. Um, the next is optimizing alternative water sources. So um, this piece in particular is one that could perhaps be in uh, almost any of the categories, but we have it here because um, because so much of this is about drinking water and it feels like equity is really a critical piece in looking at the trade-offs associated with um, expanding water use, uh, particularly equity relative to future generations. So um, this is looking at different sources of water like, like brackish water, produced water, rainwater catchment, um, cloud seeding. There's a guy, who, a gentleman who can bring in a whole lot of water from Pennsylvania on a train, uh, interstate compact, you know, interstate, I don't know, deliveries. So, um, you know, really the goal here is to put some numbers to that and figure out what the real potential is for all those different sources. And then the last piece here is continued research and planning. So this is really what we're gonna keep doing in the planning group, so more engagement. We really wanna do a, a deep dive to look at how other plans are dealing with um, changes to the status quo, right? All of our systems are kind of built for a sort of a static water reality. And this is looking at change. Um, figuring out regional planning, supporting the Water Data Act, and uh, as I mentioned, the agricultural piece. I promise I'm almost through the slides here. So this is our last, uh, this is like the last chapter being summarized here. We're working to not call it a conclusion, lest it sound like we've, you know, mastered climate change and it's concluded right here and we're done, um, since that's not the case, right? So we have this really framed as a, um, having an opportunity to, um, we have to do all this work to address things. So that's an opportunity to try and do do better and address some of the equity and other principles and uh, kind of look at the values that underlie water. So um, the current situation we're in, there were the terrible fires this year. There's also this really unprecedented amount of infrastructure funding that's available, uh, hundreds of millions of dollars. Um, and then we've got some pieces in here about next steps, looking at getting organized over the next 24 months, up to five years and beyond that. Um, so, okay, here's the last part here. This is how, uh, once we get this website up and going, looks like I put a comma after engage. That was hard to see on the small version. That's a little embarrassing. Um, but uh, this is the, this will be the website that we put up for planning and it's got, it will have the, the draft plan posted um, and an opportunity to weigh in specifically uh, about the recommendations. Um, if you have more information you wanna share, there's kind of an open format piece where you can talk about the rest of it, but, um, it's really the recommendations for moving forward that we're kind of hoping to engage people on. So, so that's my whole presentation and I, I'm going to stop sharing so I can hopefully turn my computer on and see or my screen and see if there's any questions. Um, that was a lot of talking. Sorry. <laughs>
lot of talking. Good stuff, though. Any questions? Hi. Hi, uh, Carl and Andrew. Um, I This is Carol and Kier and Kenyon. And um, I understood most everything, but could you clarify end water right declarations, please? Oh, yeah, Under yeah. sustainability. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. I've been trying to remember to catch that and it, it's always a balance so I don't get too much in the weeds. So water rights declarations are um, are basically a practice where people come into a district office for the state engineer and they say, you know, I've never told anybody about this water right, but actually we've been using water right here for a long time. And sometimes it's surface water declaration, sometimes it's uh, a well that exists that was maybe drilled before the basin was declared, so there's no record of it. Um, it's really challenging to administer water and make sure that nobody's getting impaired by anybody else when there are still an indeterminate number of water rights that might just come wandering in off the street and declare themselves at any moment. Um, and so it makes it basically impossible, like for example, if you have an undeclared right and someone else applies for a right nearby, there's no way they can make sure that's not going to impair you, right? Because they don't know anything about the fact that your right already exists. Um, Okay. So that's really challenging yeah, for the district offices and we're looking for a format to kind of sunset that to be able to get everyone to bring in their declarations. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. So that does that tie in at all with adjudication? It does. Uh, it's it's um, because it does something similar to what I mean, that's one of the goals of the adjudication, right, to kind of resolve all the water rights within a specific area uh, as as many of us who paid attention to water for any amount of time in New Mexico know those adjudications. Uh, I mean, they're geologic in their uh, speed of advancement, right? <laughs> um, so, um, but yeah, it does relate to that because it's sort of trying to address part of what the adjudications address in advance. Um, okay, great. Thank you so much. Yeah, no problem. William, you want to talk about the, the adjudication up in Eagle's Nest that you always talk about? Because that's one that, that didn't go at, at a geological time frame. Uh, <laughs> it's been so long since I talked about that. Uh, so the Interstate Stream Commission the office of the governor under Bill Richardson and the guy there was uh, the water planner. His name was Bill Hume. He was the retired editor of the Albuquerque Journal. Um, so they got together and they said, can we do kind of a mediation, turn this adjudication into a mediation and um, you know, settle this thing once and for all? And so what they did is everyone brought to the table what they considered their water rights and uh, they called it contracted water and it was 16,000 acre feet annually. And the problem was that uh, Eagle's Nest only um, produces between 12 and 15,000 acre feet annually. So on any given year, you were a thousand to 4,000 acre feet short. And so everyone, you know, people had to give up something. And so they said, what do you, what's the absolute minimum you need? Um, and, and so they started working like from that and, and trying to get, uh, I guess to, I don't know if the 12,000 figure or the 15,000 figure were maybe in the middle. Uh, but they settled it, you know, and uh, so that was their model on the time. And it was Craig uh, Repke was the deputy director of ISC under Estefan Lopez. Yeah, thanks, William. I, the adjudication piece is a pretty interesting one. And we actually don't have much about adjudication in the plan. Um, there was a lot of discussion about whether we should include more, but there, there's a lot about the adjudication that's controlled by the speed of the courts, and that's really difficult to try and sort of set initiatives and goals to achieve, like, from, from our side at the agency side. So, um, yeah, it's a really important issue. I like that model of being able to hash it out. It's hard for me to envision everybody in Albuquerque bringing their water rights and sitting down with a couple of 30,000 people and negotiating it, but it seems like a good model to try and work with. 
Um, well, that's yeah. maybe why they chose that smaller watershed. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it seems like a nice way to do that. Those adjudications yeah. are really important, but man, they, they're slow. Yeah, well, and you have 13 <clears throat> adjudications right now, right? So I think so. It's all the adjudication side is actually all out of the state engineer's office. Um, uh -huh. And there's, I know that this is like outwardly, those two agencies appear to be incredibly closely aligned. And, and they are more than any other agency. But I actually don't have any like real professional relationship with the adjudication people at this point. So, mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> Roger Taylor, <clears throat> excuse me, I was cutting weeds. <laughs> Roger Taylor uh, talks about. Uh, how El Paso uh, and actually the whole state of Texas completed all their adjudications in the last decade. And, um, you know, that's how they're able to focus their energy on New Mexico. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> because everyone agrees, you know, and, and Mex New Mexico is the culprit. Yeah, you know, it's an interesting, sorry, Carl. No, it has to be some sort of legislation then, right? You know, I mean, one of the, what I was just going to say is like one of the real challenges we looked at when we're kind of looking at trying to do these plans for New Mexico is that everybody does not agree about very much. Um, and <laughs> so, um, you know, trying to kind of capture that with the plan and kind of take all these ideas about as far as we could get before people either start, we've been thinking about people that are either like at loggerheads or they're like going in opposite directions on issues. Um, but we really don't have consensus around a lot of the water issues in the state, right? Uh, there's there's all these senior water rights that feel like they um, are, are undervalued maybe, or, or that are concerned like the commodification issue is really important to the acequias, for example. Um, and yet there's other parts of the state where commodification looks like a solution. Um, like one of the states that we look at often is Colorado who has the state water planning process that's pretty advanced and pretty far along. It would seem from just sort of observing this from the outside that somehow Colorado is like on the same page that the Denver metro area is going to boom, that small farming communities are important to maintain, but they're probably going to stay small, and that having rivers and hiking trails and protecting watersheds is like of utmost importance. We don't have that kind of consensus right across New Mexico about how things need to go. Um, so when we're like looking at a lot of our next steps, a lot of it is trying to figure out how we can kind of move that discussion forward because, um, for example, there's a lot of folks who would say that who have told us during this that they'd like to see us do priority enforcement as a way to conserve water. Um, and we've also heard that that'd be really a disaster. I mean, I, I, I think that means something like, you know, if your well was drilled after 1960, we're going to come by and plug it. Um, and, and that's got enormous consequences and has huge equity implications. And I don't know, I mean, that's that's kind of the rules that are on the books, but just straight up, you know, enforcing that would be not only really difficult, but hard to do in a non-disastrous way. So, um, so anyway, I mean, we're kind of in a tough spot there, right? Because we don't seem to have a whole lot of consensus about what needs to happen. I think that's probably part of why it works to do a little micro adjudication, because when you try and talk about the whole Pecos River and you're talking, Carlsbad Irrigation District, everybody in Roswell and the Artesian District and everybody in Las Vegas. Um, those are some pretty different perspectives about how we should be moving forward on water. So um, it's kind of challenging for us, frankly, looking forward, but that's why we have these somewhat confusing in the report, additional recommendations from tribes and acequias because we're not totally on the same page. And so trying to figure out how to kind of capture some of that and at least figure out what page everybody's on, um, is kind of where we're at. Sorry, I was allowed, I'm getting carried away talking. I've been making a lot of these long presentations and I'm like speaking in five minute bursts, so I'm sorry. <laughs> good stuff, it's really interesting. <laughs> I think it's really good stuff. Now I have, a, I have a question in terms of how this information reaches counties and cities, because that's where we run in, into issues. I mean, I'm on the, the Santa Fe Water Policy Advisory Committee and we want to do a drought plan and all of a sudden we're sitting there going, well, yeah, we got some really good ideas, but we have no way of, of doing anything with them. And so is there any intent um, plan to have what you're doing uh, spread out uh, throughout New Mexico? 
Well, I mean, I, I certainly think that would be helpful if we could kind of get some of those pieces and, you know, full credit to Santa Fe, right? Bill Schneider's over here sitting quietly in the corner and I know that they're working on some planning and he and I've been talking about how we can at least um, sync up language and talk about things in a similar way so that the so that things can be um, constructive, right? So that that's moving forward and these different pieces kind of dovetail nicely. Um, Actually, you know, the, the big cities, I mean, Santa Fe and Las Cruces and Albuquerque have pretty sophisticated groups of people who are managing their water system. The, the folks we're most concerned about are kind of the small water systems. And of course, there's some right in this area, but they've got folks like William who are paying attention to everything going on and looking out for Agua Fria. Um, that's not necessarily the case for some of the small communities that are out on their own out in the middle of nowhere, right, that are on these kind of little water systems out on anywhere. Um, think about all those places in the Mora Valley that we saw all those problems with following the fires. So those are the ones that I'm most concerned about. And actually, when we talk about all this funding and how to get it out to people, we're finding that one of the real difficulties is those water systems are so small that they don't really have kind of critical mass to have like technical and financial management staff. So they're not really in a position to apply for that funding or necessarily to operate the multi-million dollar facility that might result from receiving that funding. Um, so that's a huge, that's huge, how to tackle that, right? How do you work with like small communities and small distributed water systems to be able to kind of keep them at the, at the forefront of stuff? Um, th those are the ones I'm more concerned about. I think the cities that have, you know, whole staff on it, those are places we're going to be in touch with. Um, what about wells? Like individual, like domestic wells? Yeah, the domestic well issue is, is a really complicated one. Um, we found that in particular when we were talking with the Asakias who were saying things like, we're really concerned about groundwater use. Also, that's us who's using that groundwater. <laughs> um, so that's, and, and I think they know that, right? They can see that quandary as well. I mean, they brought it up um, that they essentially have, you know, houses that are on domestic wells directly next to these Asakias that are potentially gonna cause the Asakias to lose water faster. Um, and how do you reconcile that? I think it's it's real challenging. The domestic well users are, I think it's something like, I think our numbers in the report are that it's about 11 or 13% of the people in the state. Um, that, that's a lot of folks are doing different stuff. You know, there's some Department of Health programs out there to help with like water quality testing, but um, coordinating, especially in an area where you're at, like where you've had kind of a lot of proliferation of domestic wells, I mean, I don't, you know, that's a really challenging situation. And I don't, I don't know how you, how we resolve it, but we do have it kind of identified as part of the protecting groundwater health priorities that we need to address specifically. Just for a point of reference is there, there are 12,000 wells in Santa Fe County. And that's information that you actually provided in that graph you did at one point about the proliferation of those wells over the last 40 years. It's just mind boggling. Yeah, it really is. And so that's where you know, the Water Policy Advisory Committee wants to, to reach out to those people. Uh, but what do you tell them? You know, it's, um, it's a real challenge. And, and certainly I think the, the leadership that you guys seem to be on top of is something that really needs to, that word needs to be spread throughout the state in a way that people can react and, and understand that, that we're all in this together. Um, and I always go back to the fact in, in La Cienega, it's got to be in Spanish too, because we have a, a sizable um, migrant you know, population that, that don't understand water. And they just put a well in and then they've got horses and they've got a small farm and they just think that that's okay. Um, and they don't understand what, what, what the impact of that. And so anything that we can do as a collaborative um, is something we, this is something I think is really, really important and something I think that, that we as, as a group would really like to get behind and, and, um, and I certainly am going to encourage people to, to view this um, Zoom meeting, the recording, because I think there's some really valuable stuff that's being said. Other questions, folks? Well, I'm not going to let you go quite yet. Go ahead. Please, Sarah. Um, just a note on our engagement website. It is going to ask people to register in order to leave comments other than taking our survey. 
And I know that's annoying, but it's really, really helpful for us to start building a community kind of like list for ourselves so we can start engaging on many different issues. I've already kind of heard that kind of feedback on our website that like, is there a way to leave comments without registering? As of the moment, the only way to leave comments would be to take our survey, which you don't have to register for, but to leave general comments, which we really, really would love people to do, um, you're, you will need to register on the website, but you should be able to register through like a Gmail account really easily. But um, I just wanted to make that clear as well, that that's gonna be something. Can, can you show that website again? Uh, it's, um, well, I can drop the name of the website in the chat. We don't currently have it live yet. We're working on just a few, few small kinks, but it should be hopefully, you know, if everything goes to plan, um, live on Monday. So that's the link right there. Um, we'll be hopefully doing a larger kind of outreach to different groups and hopefully with an email that people can forward to their networks with the um, with everything, hopefully Monday or Tuesday. Do you have a question? You're waving it. <laughs> yes, it's William. like William's waving it. <laughs> Uh, I, I thought it was an excellent presentation and, and uh, of course I would expect that uh, degree of excellence from Andrew, um, you know, Absolutely. how we've worked with him over the years, so. Thanks, William, I appreciate that. It seems to me, Andrew, that this really <clears throat> needs to become more of a political issue too, uh, that we need politicians to really understand um, the depths of, of our issues with drought. You know, and, and one of the things, and, and I think Bill will understand this, is we out in the county, um, the, the city's done a great job in conserving water and managing their water. Then we get out to the county and we've got all these wells and we're sitting there going, we got to do something about this. So there's kind of like this mixed message. It's like, we, we got to tell the mill owners, you got to cut down on your water use. And they're saying, well, look at the city, look what the city's doing. They don't have to cut down. And, and so there's that kind of uh, imbalance that is, needs to be addressed. And, and um, this is where I'll put up my little wave the flag and let's do a um, regional water authority of some sort. Um, and I think those are the kinds of things we need to start looking at in terms of managing water. Um, and it's, and then one of, one of my, I'm not sure who I was talking to recently, but it might have even been in our conversation when you and I had lunch. But the idea of these small communities having little water treat, I mean, um, treatment plants for their wastewater as a way to, to, to gather some more water, replenish the aquifer, those kinds of things are things that um, we really need to start looking at and, and thinking about and see if it works in certain areas. Um, so, yeah. I think this was great, great information, Andrew and Sarah. I really think you guys have done a, a really important um, job here. And I really like to see, uh, I always like to see the Bureau of Geology and Mineral Resources as a part of what's going on because I just love their technical expertise and, and the people that work there. So um, yeah, so let's, let's talk about how we get politicians involved. Um, any thoughts on that, Andrew? <laughs> um. Sometimes it feels like they're involved already. I don't know. It's uh, <laughs> overly right? involved. Right? Yeah, no, I mean, I think, you know, it's interesting because as we've had this like really terrible summer with these fires, and of course it's horrible, like what's happened to everybody over in Mora, all this ash coming down is a real crisis. I don't know what Las Vegas is going to do with that water system. That seems like a really challenging thing to be facing. Um, I, you know, it, it seems like there's an understanding and we've been talking to people like it's interesting that even some of the communities of people that in the past have been kind of reluctant, you know, when we sit there and say like, look, we're looking at like a 30% reduction in water availability in the next 50 years. I've had more than one person say, gosh, it feels like that'd be a lot more than we're getting right now, right? <laughs> seems like we're already at 75% reduction. Um, and so I think, you know, there's there's some there's like a bit of momentum, like we're on this tipping point and it feels like we're tipping a little more than we have done in the past. Um, and, you know, I, I hate that it takes like a crisis for that to happen, right? I mean, it's like, I don't know, one of the things you always joke about in planning or not even joke, like one of the, the 
things you try and do in planning is build a crosswalk before somebody has to get hit by a car, right? Um, and it's hard to do that. Um, but it seems like the climate issues are all over the place. I mean, every time I look in the paper, it's about flooding. Sorry, I'm getting on my five minute speech again. Go ahead, Maury. <laughs> no, I, I, I think I, I had a related question and based on what Carl was saying about the regional water authority too, is, is what role you think the 50 year water plan has in kind of making governance recommendations that rather than specific policies um, as, as the full focus, focusing also on shifting our governance structures to better respond to these emergencies and be prepared for them before they happen. Because it seems to me that so many of our challenges, even with, you know, um, considering and incorporating acequias and pueblos and nations into our collaboration is, is like government um, friction and you know, challenges with governance. So I know that that's like a much larger <laughs> issue, but if there's a way to um, kind of incorporate that or reference that in this recommendation, or because this is a state document that's kind of outside of your purview. No, that's that's a great question. And we are trying to do some recommendations like that, right? So there's one of those categories was about modernizing administrative practices for water. Um, and, and, you know, so we're trying to look at how to kind of streamline some of those pieces, how to be more forward looking. Um, there's those steps in the back for kind of 24 month and five years and all this. And one of the real goals there is to um, work with the other agencies so that we can tackle these multi-agency projects together and be a lot more transparent about the fact that this is essentially like one budget request that stretches across numerous agencies um, from a kind of administration standpoint. That's one of the real challenges is that you try and tackle these things and, you know, it's a good year for the state. Well, I'm not sure there ever was a good year for the state engineer for getting state funding, but there have been good years for, you know, the environment department and MNERD and it kind of tends to, to vary. Um, so trying to figure out how to kind of level that out so that those big complicated things can get tackled together is an important piece. Um, regionalization is one of these really tricky ones because it's one of these areas we don't have consensus about, right? As evidenced by the fact that the city's not super hot about it, which is probably more my fault than Bill's. Um, and um, I, you know, I think one of the really constructive comments that I heard from some of the legislators, we, we got to uh, go and attend this interim Natural Water and Natural Resource Commission meeting for the legislature recently. And one of the members there was talking about kind of a spectrum of regionalization and looking at, you know, kind of the full blown version would be like interconnected pipes and shared administration and maybe the, the least uh, committal version would be, you know, something like uh, not connecting pipes at all, but working together to have sort of a greater financial capacity to be able to take on debt so that projects could get built in those systems. Um, and that there's kind of a spectrum between these things of like how much you you benefit from um, you know more scale right how what the right kind of relationship is to for each of those communities so um, so we don't have that answer I don't think there really is a one size fits all answer for that but it does seem like like the way she framed that I've been thinking a lot about it it seemed like a really productive way to kind of look at how to tackle regional systems and like it's not it doesn't have to be all or nothing right perhaps you just work together to share grant opportunities or to help the, the small system that's nearby to have sort of the financial backing to apply for a large grant that allows them to put in some more sophisticated infrastructure. Um, so yeah, so we're looking at it and trying to make some recommendations to move there, but it is kind of the, the 20,000 foot view, if that makes sense, yeah. <laughs> Quick question, Maury. Um, I just feel like we need to engage politicians more. I'm thinking Liz Stefanik is head of the conservation um, committee now. She's our, my senator. Um, I would love to invite her to maybe come to one of our collaborative meetings and talk a little bit about that. And I'm obviously going to invite you to it as well, Andrew, um, because I just think these are kind of important, especially in this day and time with all that's going on. These are the times where we really need to, to look to each other and and talk about these things and get them out in the open now one of the things one of the comments i want to make too go ahead i interview first i was just going to say to make sure to give credit where it's due liz stefanix was very actively engaged and participating at the meeting i was just talking about so just she, she's engaged already yeah yeah but one of the things i want you know the pipeline coalition this group that's that's 
been, been together for a while now. Um, to me, this is an example of the city and county working together and supporting something. And, and to me, um, I think the outcome of this is gonna be pretty important. And I think it's something that, that is valuable. And I think I really wanna give Bill some credit because um, he and I have done a lot of talking about these kinds of things and their support, the water staff, uh, water department staff, uh, the water folks at the city and the county um, really have supported this and, and made a difference in terms of, of this, the success of this, this planning process. So um, that to me is an example of how we can cooperate and work together and, and do something with the county and, and city uh, on the same page. But I really think your, your, your point about Colorado being on the same page, you've got the whole state on the same page. That's going to be a real challenge in New Mexico. We know that because we have such a large state and such differences between um, cultural and political views on uh, different parts of the state. But it's certainly something we need to, to keep doing it. But I really would like to invite Liz to our next meeting and see if she's got the time to, to spend some time uh, chatting with us. Um, any other questions for this um, great presentation by Mr. Erdman? Okay. Yeah, uh, Carl, this is Sterling. Okay. Hey, uh, yeah, just a, a, a brief one, I think. Uh, Andrew, this is, uh, it's now been more than 22 years since the Office of the State Engineer published the first report on the impact of climate change on New Mexico's water resources. And I wondered if in, in your planning, uh, there's been any reflection on what has changed, what has stayed the same, and what has not been addressed since that first OSE report? Yeah, you know, that's a great question. I, and and the, the easy answer is that there's not a tremendous amount, right? This, is, this has been this project that was kicked off by our current governor when she was running for office and has been pretty much a... Um, pretty much this one time effort looking forward at these pieces and, and getting these um, projections pulled together right now. But I'm really happy you brought that up. We have our state water plan due next year and that would seem like a really appropriate component to look backwards at the at what's been done and not done and be able to put some context to those pieces. So um, I'm sorry to give you the answer that no, we haven't done that yet, but I really appreciate you bringing that up so we can look at that soon. Thank you. That, that connection that we don't have right now, right? Mm -hmm. William. Um, you know, our legislators are very concerned about water, I'd say over the last decade or so, but I think that they get maybe a little overwhelmed by some of the presentations and they wanna hear more from the community side. And there, are, there aren't a lot of experts on the community side of it, um, but you know, I, I know that they're, they're very interested. Um, I think that they very much trust the Interstate Stream Commission as opposed to Office of State Engineer. I think they kind of look at the state engineer as aloof or ineffective or, you know, some, something like that. So they've turned a lot to Interstate Stream Commission for uh, information. That's an excellent point, William, because Obviously, I was, I was going to ask about um, kind of the opinion of the Office of the State Engineer because all we hear is all the kind of commotion and, and issues and bureaucratic things that go on there. Um, and it certainly impacts a whole lot of people when they can't process, process things quickly or if they don't have staff or certain things. So I think that's, that's that, that because it could be a governance issue and something maybe we look at and, and um, but that's an excellent question. Thanks, William. Appreciate that one. Wow. Um, anything else, folks? Any questions? I do want to recognize, I don't know if everybody knows Michelle Hunter, who is a new uh, water resources person with the county. Um, so we're, we're happy to have her here. She's new. Um, Thanks so much, Carl. You're welcome. And with that, I'm going to lead into the new executive director of the Santa Fe Watershed Association. And I got to tell you now, I haven't known Maury for very long, but boy, I'm impressed. You know, there's there's a vision, there's a 
uh, a passion um, and things that, that are just gonna be really helpful in terms of, of her managing the Watershed Association. Um, and we look forward to a long um, and good relationship with you. So Maury, uh, transitions in leadership at the Santa Fe Watershed Association. Thank you, Carl. Thank you so much for <laughs> those generous compliments. And thanks, Andrew, again, for your presentation too, and all that you've taught me since I've worked at the Watershed Association <laughs> and working with you in, in different ways. And um, yeah, thank you all. I think, um, as I've told some of you in, in our conversations, I'm, I'm very much in sponge mode right now. So I'm listening and, and continuing to learn. And, uh, but I definitely look forward to reaching out to you all more in the coming weeks and months to really reinforce our, our connections and see how we can keep moving forward and collaborating. Um, I, I don't really have anything super prepared for this and, and don't wanna take up too much time, but um, Andy transitioned away from the, the role in mid-July and um, I'm really grateful for his mentorship and leadership through the process. It's been very inspiring and, and unique, um, you know, that he took many months to train me and, and our whole staff has kind of been part of this transition process. And um, so it's, it's been, I think, as smooth as it could possibly be, but now I'm still just um, stepping into the role and, and getting all of the sort of background work <laughs> done and, and um, in my brain. So we're, we're doing a lot of internal updating type of work right now. So that's why uh, you haven't heard much from me so far, but um, I think, you know, we, we are celebrating our 25th anniversary. We're looking back at all of the things that the watershed has accomplished over that time and, and our really strong relationships. And, and this collaborative is definitely um, something that is really valuable and important to the Watershed Association. And so I, I'm excited to continue to support this group and these relationships, however I can. And, and I know my coworkers feel the same way. So um, I think we're really trying to take advantage of this time and kind of our anniversary and looking back and looking forward to, to regroup and, and think about and imagine what the future of the Watershed Association needs to be to, um, to act on and support uh, the, the types of conditions that are changing in the watershed and in our communities that Andrew has touched on, you know, that, that we wanna be able to be that slightly more flexible um, and connecting piece um, because we are a small nonprofit, we should be able to, to be a little bit more, um, yeah, a little bit more flexible than, than sometimes government structures are able to be in specific situations or you know that that I think my understanding so far is is that we play a very important connecting role in making sure that our community members are uh, having their voices and concerns heard and that the policies and um, you know thought processes that that our govern government water managers at different scales are working through are also being communicated and, and received by our community members. Um, and so I think that's a pretty foundational piece that, that I want to keep and, and then strengthening our, our relationships, you know, to, to make all of our communities more resilient as we prepare for more frequent emergencies and, um, and as we continue to be more and more connected. So um, yeah, I, I will look forward to continuing to participate in the, in the collaborative and support it however I can. And um, yeah, I, I think Sterling has a question and then Bill. Hey, Maury, so glad you're there. I love the Watershed Association. I'm an Arroyo steward. And I would just like to uh, put in a plug for the Watershed Association taking a slightly more aggressive technically more aggressive uh, posture on water on uh, stormwater management. I think the city could use uh, input from the Watershed Association more than it has. And uh, I just encourage you to look at that piece of the problem. So glad you're there. Thanks. 
Thanks so much, Sterling. Yeah, that that is definitely um, on the top of our minds. And um, it, I, I know it's just one small project, but we we are wrapping up our um, NMED grant that we, we built a really beautiful rain garden downtown um, along the river corridor right on basically near El Castillo. And um, I think that We've got some great partners with the city right now. And um, so we're really looking to kind of expand that on a more systems level to, to um, help support the city and, and the county in reframing this paradigm of stormwater to utilize it as a tool. So I think that's that's gonna be a very core part of our identity, which, which has already, the seeds have been planted already yes. you know, long before I came in. So. Um, yeah, I, I definitely am, you know, stormwater, green stormwater evangelist. So <laughs> uh, happy to talk more about it and yeah, expand it however we can. Would you um, ex <clears throat> explain what a rain garden is? Absolutely. Yeah, they're, they're also called bioretention basins. I'm, I'm sure you all have seen them or, or have heard of them in some way, but uh, basically they're, they're a small small to medium sized basin that diverts stormwater running off of our streets or rooftops and gives that stormwater a place to um, disperse its its energy to infiltrate into the the groundwater rather than just scouring our soil and um, shunting a lot of polluted water into our arroyos and river um, so rather than that the, these rain gardens give the water a place to slow, to drop the sediment, to drop the pollutants. And then we have special plants and microbes in the soil that um, are actually being shown to break down even these really toxic petrochemicals and whatnot um, that uh, we're working with Reese Baker at the Rain Catcher, who's doing a lot of research on um, like oyster mushrooms and, and other fungal species that are, that can actually break down these um, pollutants coming off of streets and whatnot and turn them into biologically usable compounds. Um, and so we're, we're breaking down pollutants and we're um, infiltrating the stormwater. So obviously it's uh, actually, there was a great article in the reporter a couple days ago about it, about uh, the, the rain garden downtown, but basically I think they're a really wonderful tool that we have. Obviously, they're they're not going to solve all of our water security problems, but I think that um, you know infiltrating and using our stormwater and having a more hydrologically healthy way that we deal with stormwater is is ideal. So I think rain gardens are an exciting way to do that. And so, however many we can build, particularly in very paved, impermeable environments. Um, they're a really useful tool. Obviously, in, in less paved areas, there are other useful tools that kind of complement the ideas of rain gardens, you know, the, the build Z-dike models of uh, slowing, spreading, sinking water um, using those low-tech low tech, um, structures and whatnot. It, it's all very important and all kind of based on the same concepts. So, um, yeah. I'll, Adelina, I'll, I'll answer Bill's question real quick and then <laughs> um, thank you for asking that, Bill. I, that is something that I was hoping to bring up as well. So we, as many of you know, we've been working on this WaterSmart grant from the Bureau of Reclamation for the last couple of years. Um, it's a phase one grant where we've interviewed many of you um, as, as stakeholders in the watershed and, and we've been identifying priorities and we hope that this report is going to be useful in, in a lot of the other planning that's going on and, and we're kind of hoping to brainstorm about what the next steps the Watershed Association can take in this process. I think a lot of us have the goal of, of writing um, a, a watershed-wide plan. Um, so I think that that's the goal for a lot of us, but what avenues we take and who, you know, who are the, the writers and who are the collaborators and who are the funders and all of that are, are details we want to work out. But I'm happy to report that 
um, after a lot of delays with COVID and all of this stuff, um, we do have a first draft of the report uh, that I just read yesterday. Um, and so we, we were able to interview, I think over 60 stakeholder um, representatives and, and then follow up with them. We, we did a methodology called a Q sort, which is kind of a way to quantify qualitative priorities. Um, and, and we had over 40 folks continue to participate in that process. Um, and so the, the plan right now is that we're hoping to hold a, a, a few workshops in early October um, for our stakeholders and community members, such as yourselves. Um, hopefully we can hold one to two in person and then have one over Zoom. And uh, the idea with that will be that we will share the report, our, our um, social scientists who are in charge of designing the, the survey or the interviews and all of that um, will we'll present their findings. And then we can have a community discussion and make sure that we are ac accurately representing everyone's priorities. And um, of course, all of the priorities are anonymous. Everyone is anonymous in the, in the report. And some very clever steps have been taken to make sure that, you know, even when one stakeholder group was represented, you know, that that person is, is fully anonymous. Um, so we're, we're kind of editing that first draft right now and I will continue to update you all. And um, I, I'll be reaching out to Bill and other folks from the city soon to, you know, start hopefully hosting those. Maybe we can co-host them together and um, uh, yeah, I hope that you all will, will participate in those workshops. I'll be sure to keep you updated on those, but um, I'm excited with kind of the, the findings and hopefully, as, uh, as I said, it's a service to all of the other planning initiatives that are going on right now. And hopefully it's a way that we can also work together to move towards writing of a comprehensive watershed wide plan. So, um, Adeline. <laughs> yeah, that was pretty cool. Now, these are the social scientists from the University of Utah, correct? Yes. Wow, this is really exciting. I want to go back to the rain garden a little bit because I want a lot of them everywhere. Um, and I want to see how big they can get because we have issues out our way, um, specifically the um, Arroyo Chimiso and the Arroyo Hondo. Uh, obviously, I don't think we can put rain gardens in there. <clears throat> but it's one of those things as we look to the future, <clears throat> and I think this, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> and I think this is something that that a lot of people would agree on. If we can slow that water, the flood waters down, and allow that water to get into the aquifer, um, it's something that would be a good thing to do. And this is where, um, if Bill's still around, um, is something that that uh, we would love to talk to the to the the city about. Um, because we're the folks down in La Cienega. We just had, a, a, I mean, we had a small flood um, at our house, basically La Cienega Creek was, was running uh, fuller than, than the Arroyo Hondo, uh, which is right below where we live. Uh, it was pretty amazing amount of water that's coming down. And if we can start to figure out ways to slow that water, let it spread out um, and help the, help the earth, basically help the aquifer, it's just something I think we really need to, to look at and, and to think about. So uh, that's just a comment, Bill. Um, so if you can pull any strings over the city and make that happen, we'd appreciate it. Um, <laughs> this is where one of the challenges I think you have, Bill, is because you have like three different kind of divisions, right? You got the water department, you got the wastewater folks, and then you got the stormwater folks. And it seems like to us from the outside, that that might not be the easiest way to do things sometimes. Yeah, it poses challenges, Carl. Um, I do I do like your your strategic thinking on that topic, and maybe it's something that will get rolled out as part of the uh, of the Santa Fe River planning process. Yeah, it could. I didn't think of it that way, but yeah. Wow. Well, and I know that um, the, the public works department, you know, has their um, East Alameda River Corridor plan 
Um, and, and so this rain garden we just finished is part of that. And so I know that their goal, at least in the short term, is to build rain gardens along the river corridor, but it would be great if we could expand that and support the city being inspired to <laughs> build rain gardens all over. I mean, what if we converted medians? What if we converted you know, street corners? And there, there's so many, not to mention, unused parking spaces and and incorporating that into new building codes you know there's so many ways to um utilize stormwater more effectively yeah and that's that's why i had my hand up too um Good. well first maury congratulations on your new position um and i'm really happy to hear that the santa fe watershed association will be really focusing on green stormwater infrastructure I also think it's really important and a, a great tool that's underutilized in New Mexico and one that's also really connected to this long range planning that um, Andrew, I believe, uh, brought up. I think that's his name. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yes, right. uh, um, and it's also a policy opportunity in the state. For example, I think it's the city of Tucson has some pretty progressive code um, for green water, green stormwater infrastructure. Um, so they're really moving away from that gray model and they are facing some of the same issues that we are with like heavy pre precipitation events resulting in flooding. Um, so just emulating those models in municipalities here. I think that there's a lot of potential for that. Yeah, Kathleen, you're new to the group and I apologize, but would you tell us a little, about, little bit about yourself? Sure, yeah. So I recently started as the open space and trails planner for Santa Fe County. Prior to that, I was the sustainability specialist for a few years. And I've interacted with some of you in that role. Um, and I'm specifically here today because Santa Fe County, or in this group and going forward, uh, because Santa Fe County has um, an open space along the Santa Fe River, the La Cienegia open space, um, which is of course in a traditional community. Um, so I'm here to just be present if any conversations ever occur um, around that area. But also like I can communicate information here to other people in, in the county, like the sustainability team who's more involved in green stormwater infrastructure than I am now in my current role. Tell us about Tucson again. They actually put it into code yeah, they did. So I attended the Land and Water Summit um, earlier this year in Albuquerque. It's an annual conference. And there was a huge contingency of people from Tucson telling us about the amazing work they've been doing there. I haven't looked up the code myself, but there is kind of a, a grassroots movement to create a green water, green stormwater infrastructure ordinance there. So we can do that here. Yeah, yeah, I think we should. <laughs> That's something I think we should all try and push for. <clears throat> I think we've got the right people both on the county commission and on the city council that would be really very interested in this kind of thing. This is I where think. I think we need, and I, I, it, it's a little bit of a struggle because we're just a, you know, a volunteer organization. We get together and talk a lot um, and we write letters on occasion. Maybe this is the letter that we write. Um, I think it is a letter that we write um, and, and ask that this is something that the city council and the county commission seriously consider um, as a way of helping our water resources. So let's make sure, I, this is where I need a note. So I'm gonna write, more you'll probably remind me of this, but <clears throat> let's write a letter soon um, to the city council and to the county commission saying this is something that's very important. And I agree, Bill, these are the kinds of things that would help um, out our way. It would help the springs. And that is one of the components of the um, planning process for the return flow 
pipeline project, which would lead me into my part of the, the presentation. So we had just completed the RFP for the draft RFP for the um, stakeholder involved planning process as a result of the return flow pipeline project. It also gets, there are a lot of words there. <clears throat> and we did a pretty darn good job, I think. And, and to give everybody the sequence of what we did, um, this was included in the agreement between the county and city that this planning process would be um, done. Um, it started out last, I think October, if I'm correct, October, November, when we had our first sessions with Lucy Moore, we had two facilitated Zoom meetings. Um, she produced a document or a draft R RFP, and then our group, um, the Pipeline Coalition RFP subcommittee, <clears throat> and anybody that wants a copy of this RFP, we're, we're ready to, to share it with anybody that would like to see it. Um, but there's some interesting parts of this. And one of the things I really want to recognize is this planning process allows us to address legacy issues, issues or problems that we've had over the years. And, and as the, um, the, the La Siena Guia open space, this is something that is important for all of us to, to kind of recognize because um, there's been some issues and things that we need to address. And I'm not gonna get into those right now, but in terms of the process, um, we really had some very interesting discussions and, and really came up with some really pretty good ideas. And I think the, the RFP really does capture a lot of, um, captures everything that we, we wanna address. Uh, some of the highlights I think is, one of them is, uh, and this is something Bill and I have talked about. Uh, sometimes we have new people in government or new people in organizations uh, that don't have the same sense or understanding of the cultural uh, significance of both the, the Pueblo people and, and the Spanish or the Sequia um, cultures. And we think it's important that, that people understand those things that, that are a part of this. And so one of the components we're asking for in that RFP is, is to have that recognized and, and being able to do. Um, some of the other parts, and, and Bill and I have talked about this, is the restoration of the springs of La Cienega. Now, we're the second largest wet, um, wetlands in New Mexico, um, and we've had problems. And there's no question that the biggest problem, <clears throat> besides the drought, is the proliferation of residential wells. There's no, no hiding that fact. Um, I estimate in the last 40 years, we've had probably between three and 400 wells put into that area. Um, and we've seen a significant decline in, in, the, um, in the aquifer. Now it is stabilized. It hasn't gotten, it's, it's stabilized at a low level. So it isn't going down much, uh, but that may be because of aquifer um, recharge, not aquifer recharge, but because of um, septic recharge. And so what we wanna do is get, bring, start to bring some of that water back. And there's a series of steps that we can take to do that that will be included in this process um, in this process, in the planning process that we want to bring forward and talk about. And one of them, and for those of you that don't know, there's four wells in the El Dorado district area that impact our, our springs. Uh, and they've been over pumped. They've dropped significantly in, in terms of, of well depth. Um, and if we can get them to stop using those wells, there's only, actually, they're just using three out of the four wells now. Um, but if we can get them to stop using those wells, that will help our springs. So those are the kinds of things that are included in this plan. Um, and one of the interesting parts that we, we want to have done is those groups that are interested in the river, uh, we want to do a survey and gather information from them so we can con have that contribute to the overall plan, get some information. And um, so I think that's important stuff. And I'm kind of rambling a little bit, but it, the process to me was so important. Um, and it is an example of people coming forward and, and with the willingness to spend some time working on important issues. Um, and this obviously is a very important issue to us. Um, There's a total of 26 entities, organizations, associations, and individuals that make up the pipeline coalition. And it's, <clears throat> and it's gotten pretty dynamic. And I think it's something that, that <clears throat> is something that will serve everybody well in the future. <clears throat> Excuse me, I have no, I didn't cut weeds, I just have a cough. Anyway, um, 
but it's an exciting time and I really look forward to the opportunity of people looking at this RFP, giving us feedback, telling us what they think. Um, it has gone to the county for them to do their, um, what they need to do to put it in a formal posting. Um, and then what we're looking forward to the opportunity of actually being able to um, participate in the selection of the facilitator. Um, and so that's something that, that's down, that was an agreement that John Dupuy uh, offered us some time ago. And so, um, yeah, I'm excited about it. It's in process. <clears throat> I'm hoping within the next maybe four to six weeks, we can actually post the, the, um, post the position. Uh, and then we'll be ready to, to move forward in terms of um, helping that facilitator do a really good job in planning the, the future of our community. Um, not the future of our community, the future of the Santa Fe River. Um, so that's a real quick, brief um, update on what's going on with the um, return flow pipeline planning process. Um, any questions about that? Now, one of the things that, that next part is kind of a reflection of the, the collaborative meeting, um, collaborative meeting, collaborative organization. And one of the things I'm, I'm working on is an index <clears throat> on all of the presentations that have been done on Zoom meetings. So people can actually <clears throat> look at something and go, oh, oh, here, there's something I want to check out and um, note. But what it did too is, kind of forced me to look at what we've done over the last couple of years. And it's pretty impressive, but I think there's, there's something that at times where, where we have a great idea, but we, can't, we don't carry it forward. Um, and I think that's one of the things we'll do at the next meeting uh, is to look at those issues and see if there's any particular areas that we really kind of want to push more. Um, it's one thing to talk about things. It's another thing to take action. Um, and I think we've done an excellent job in, in discussing issues, but I think there comes a point, especially now, that we really need to move the needle a little bit and, and do something a little more constructive um, and, and really push. And I think the idea of, of sending things to the um, city council and to the county commission about rain gardens is an example of that. Uh, those are the kinds of things that maybe at this, not maybe at this point that we should be doing. Um, and so that will be something to be part of our, our next meeting uh, is an opportunity to look at those things because uh, it's a wide range of things. We have some really powerful people um, talking about water issues um, and some excellent presenters. Um, and those are resources and, and things that, that we need to follow up on. Um, so that's kind of my rambling of the morning. Um, so is there anything else today, folks? Well, uh, again, welcome aboard, Maury. Welcome, Adeline. Welcome, Michelle. Um, oh, and I want to recognize Jay Christie real quick, who is a landowner in um, La Cienegia, very close to the um, open space. So I'm sure he'll be interested in what, what's going on there. Jay, you have anything to say? Uh, currently, no, just still partaking, just trying to show up to as much of this stuff as I can to get a, get a, get a grasp of it. There's a lot happening and we've got a lot of water and trying to figure out what to do with it, but I'm happy to be here. Trying, happy that you're all presenting a ton of interest in and uh, appreciate it. Okay. Hey, Kieran, Carol, how were the rains for you? Thanks. Yeah. Okay, Oops, yeah. Sorry, they didn't be relentless. But the, uh, the Asaki has been running really well, I think, in a large part to the work that Cornerstones has done on it over the last couple of years. So it's still running very well. and uh, Which has never happened. Never happened before. We've been down here, what, 27, 28 years now? And, right. Uh, we've had constant problems, and this year is one of the first years ever that it's been very consistent in terms of flow and not going down and requiring like crisis management at the last minute. So we're very weren't, pleased so far. Why don't you tell people a little bit about your little uh, place in El Cañon? 
Well, we, um, El Canyon is an old village. Now it's a village of one, I guess you'd say, just Carol and I. And we boarded the old Alonzo Rael Ranch, which was purchased by BLM 11 years ago. And we're still waiting on a public access management plan 11 years later, but the wheels of government, as we know, move very, very slowly. However, uh, we had a meeting actually down here with Pamela Mathis and, and uh, Mar, who uh, is the, well, she's one of the project managers. We've never met the project manager down here uh, who she uh, works with. But they came down to just kind of see the scope of the, you know, the scope of their, you know, our public land. And um, I think that that was so valuable because they really understood at that point all of the um, communications that we'd, you know, tried to have with them over the many years. And um, it was really a very productive meeting. We are not sure that you know it'll go any faster but um making the connection was really valuable how big is it i just like to add that the royal ditch is a private acequia and basically there's only two parcientes us and the federal government now so there's no association because you need three people to have an association there's just two of us so uh we basically rely on cornerstones at the moment they have a what do you call it? A partnership agreement with BLM to kind of do work on the Asakia. And they're doing a historic structures report on the old ranch house and sort of moving forward slowly, but moving forward, which is the main thing. Right. How many acres of farmland is there in the in the Rael Ranch? What was the question, Carl? The the Rael Ranch that they're managing right now is the field is a five acre field but then there's but then across the river there's more with some other his um heritage apple trees, apple trees some of them some of them have made it some haven't and um but the whole ranch was thousands and thousands of acres and um historically yeah and uh and then little by little it went to trust for public land and then the the final sale was 33 acres i believe it was i think the last sale which is basically the ranch house the field uh i don't know if you're familiar with the area but there's a big white cross that's painted up on the side of the mountain and that's part of the last purchase also right so that's that us product. down here in the canyon well, and you asked you about the you asked about the about the rains um, I've added it up this morning, and since June 16th, we've had 12 inches of rain here. Wow. That Which is, is the, you know, I think, isn't that the annual? <laughs> yeah. Those tomato plants are like six and a half feet tall. It's unbelievable. <laughs> and so are the weeds, William. <laughs> oh, God, tell me about it. So yeah. how long is your sakia? It's a mile and a half long. This is yeah. uh, one of the stops on the tour, Maury, so we get a chance to, to see that place. It's a pretty special place, absolutely. Yeah. How's your road? Well, it's still there. It's holding. <laughs> We're supposed to get a FedEx delivery today, so we'll see if they make it down or not. We'll see. I'm not sure. <laughs> yeah. William? Um. Pamela Mathis has, has been really uh, proactive in things. Uh, uh, Commissioner Anna Hansen had her come to the Awafria Village Association meeting. Um, they're oh. very much interested in the Caja del Rio uh, uh, Plateau uh, mm -hmm. uh, holdings that they have. Uh, they're also looking at doing that shooting range or probably three shooting ranges: a north mm -hmm. one, a central one, um, you know, somewhere between uh, uh, Agua Fria and La Cienega, and then a southern one all the way down at San Pedro. And I think mm -hmm. we really need it because the the shooting, uh, you know, they take TVs out on top of the mesa and blast away, and it's just so much garbage. It, and, and we've been working a lot with uh, Garrett Van Cleason with New Mexico Wild, uh, with cleanups and, you know, so, I mean, it seems to be a new era in, in uh, I don't know, land management. 
Yeah, yeah we're, we're, we're pleased with it. Yeah, and the shooting is is unbelievable, and uh, and it's really timely because uh, literally every weekend and lots of weekdays during COVID, they've been shooting right up on the mesa above us. I think um, tomorrow, the I, I think New Mexico Wild and uh, a lot of the like Caja del Rio coalition folks are are having a big event over at Santa Fe Brewing off of uh, Highway 14. Um, so I'm not sure if I'll be able to make it, but I think it is really exciting um, to to watch that coming together and. Um, yeah, I'm excited to learn more about it. Even a rumor if that, you all are available. <laughs> <laughs> there's even a rumor they're no, looking at trying to acquire it. Trace Rios Ranch, which is which is for sale right now. So we'll see if that happens. That would be pretty amazing. Um, Michelle, would you like to offer anything? Any news, anything you've done to share with us? How has your experience with the county so far? <laughs> so far, it's, everything is great. Um, I'm just kind of still trying to get my arms around every everything that I'm um, supposed to be doing with respect to um, like the WPAC tonight and the um, the pipeline, the the users, the, the RFP that you talked about that that I'm reviewing just to uh, and I need to talk with Bill about that at some point and um, trying to just kind of figure out what my purview is and enjoying it immensely i have to say it's a, it's been a great experience so far and thank you all for embracing me as much as you have and i really look forward to to more of this and more collaboration i'm told i i read about the um the stormwater um what, i'm sorry i can't remember the exact name the Green the gardens the gardens that you that you all did in the newspaper the other day i i like uh, like who, Carl, whoever mentioned, they wanted to see them all over the place. I think that that would be a really, really helpful thing to our to our uh, recharge issues in in the in for groundwater. It's those are amazing structures, and I would love to see them everywhere in the county as well. It would. Uh, I think that getting uh, Brad Lancaster to to come talk to us would be terrific because I think that the time is right and we could um, with sustainability's real um, push right now towards um, all the, the amazing things that they're doing I think that this fits right into that and and I can help as much as I, I possibly can to uh, to help the the side of everything that's on the county and yeah so I appreciate the opportunity to, to just kind of catch everyone up on what I'm trying to figure out at this point after two months, but it's been a fantastically steep learning curve and I've, uh, I've enjoyed every minute of it so far. So thanks so much for continuing to, to attend these things and, um, and listen to, to all of the wonderful groups that are, that are around Santa Fe that are working on all these issues. Thanks. Well, we do have some new faces. Um, and they're all women, which I kind of think is interesting, <laughs> but that's cool. Um, I sometimes think the women should run the world, but that's a whole different political issue. And I do want to recognize Mr. Griego, who is sitting there. And Robert, you have anything to say? Uh, no, I, I don't have anything uh, additional to add, but, you know, I do like the, uh, you know, the, the, the women running the world here, you probably get things done a little bit better than, <laughs> than we're doing now, but some of the ideas that have been floated here, it's like, how do, you know, again, we, we've talked about some of these things over the years, how do we make them happen, and, and you know, it's good to see things that are actually happening. And, um, you know, again, as, uh, as was discussed, uh, you know, we are looking at things a little bit more with our MS4 program now as well, trying to look at, you know, some of the um, uh, stormwater issues. So I think the, the, the timeliness is good. There are any final words from uh, the Interstate Stream Commission? Um, just hopefully we can get a lot of comments on the draft plan and uh, we will get it out to you as soon as it's available. Thanks so much for having us here today. Okay, folks, this, any other words for today? Dominique, good to see you.
Great to see you all, and I'm so glad to meet Maury and, and Michelle and all of you and see old friends like Kieran and Carol. It's been really great. Dominique Thanks. was one of the people who walked the river from yeah. the, um, yeah. Ten years ago now. Wow, that's amazing, isn't it? Yeah, isn't it amazing? <laughs> yeah, can't believe it. Well, a sincere thanks to all of you. As I generally say, this is one of my favorite groups to get together with. Uh, really interesting uh, information. I think today was very powerful, and I certainly am going to encourage people to to pull this up and look at it if they weren't able to attend today. Um, and we will get a letter to our political uh, elected officials talking about rain gardens. Um, it just makes sense, folks. It's just a, one of those little simple things that could really make a difference in terms of the quality of water, uh, the quality of water and recharge. It's pretty amazing. So thank you very much. Uh, Maury, thank you so much for hosting this as always. Um, we look forward to a, a bright water future. Thanks, folks. Thank you. Bye. Bye.